morning, everyone. Welcome to our worship service here this morning. Glad to see you all, especially the kiddos. Uh, we are glad that we can worship here together all to, uh, with the kids and the youth and the adults. Um, I think it's a, a special time for us to get together at the beginning of the week to start the week off right. And glad for those who are able to join us uh, in Sunday school this morning. It was a nice packed room. Um, we'll have to figure out how to rearrange seats if we get more people next week. Uh, but uh, as always, you guys are all, everybody's invited to join. Uh, so let's, uh, let's stand as we worship God together. Amazing grace.
demonstrated your, your great love for us. For that, we're forever grateful, Lord. Help us to remember your powerful forgiveness uh, that you bestowed upon us, that you've made us clean. And Father, you want us to um, bestow that forgiveness and love to others uh, around us. And so we pray that you would help us to do that. We pray that you would speak uh, from your word this morning. Um, Lord, that your word would touch us and change us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to keep standing here because we do this thing where we affirm our faith by uh, saying the Apostles' Creed together. So let's do that. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. Now you may be seated. All right, before we continue, I just want to uh, run through some announcements that we have. So this week, uh, we have a couple of things going on for our youth. Uh, one will be on Wednesday. It's going to be a service opportunity. Uh, it's going to happen at this uh, organization called the Northwest Children's Outreach. And uh, you can see the, the address in Beaverton here. It's going to be on Wednesday night, starting at 7 o'clock. Uh, and there is a, a sign-up link for this. So they have a, a limited number of slots. Um, and if, um, if you're getting the new youth newsletter, the link will be in there. If you're not getting the youth newsletter, please uh, get in touch with one of the youth leaders, and we want to get you added to that because there's a lot of important information and announcements um, that get distributed that way. So uh, service opportunity coming up on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we have our kind of our regular meeting. Um, but we'll be doing a field day and a senior send-off. So that will be happening uh, Friday at, the, at 7.30. Uh, and then for uh, we also have a few uh, weekly events that give us an opportunity to kind of connect throughout the week. Uh, one of those happens on Tuesday evenings. Um, we have a fellowship group that meets. Um, we also have prayer meeting uh, at 8 o'clock. That happens over Zoom. Um, and then as mentioned before, uh, we have Sunday school. Um, that's open to both adult and to youth. Um, on Sunday mornings at 9.30. Um, so we, we recently had our summer retreat, and so one of the announcements we want to keep on making here is that uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, make an offering for that, uh, we do have the costs kind of outlined here on this slide. Um, if you have any questions, um, please let one of the, the leaders know. Um, coming up later this month, uh, we have a unique opportunity to have a kind of an all city uh, worship service. Uh, this is going to be happening um, down at the Waterfront Park um, in downtown Portland. Uh, this will be Sunday afternoon, so we will have we will have our regular Sunday morning worship here um, as, we, as we do. And then uh, in addition to that, at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, we're all invited to join together uh, with other churches in the area. And there's going to be uh, a worship service. Um, there'll be some, some chances to kind of uh, fellowship with each other and um, some food there as well. Uh, it's July and August is coming up really soon. We have our VBS. I've been announcing this for a little while, um, but we're really excited to have this for our kids. Um, I think, uh, as far as I know, all the slots have been taken and are still they're still um, full at the moment. But as soon as we get more volunteers, 
um, we will be able to open more slots for that. So if you are interested in volunteering, uh, please get a hold of Jenny. Uh, she's our children's director, and then she can help uh, connect you with opportunities for um, helping our kids. I think that's all we have. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you I was not able to meet last week, my name is Drew Torado. I live in Portland with my wife Haley, sitting here on the front row, and I attend classes at Western Seminary where I'm pursuing my Master of Divinity degree. Uh, I'm filling in this morning for Pastor Stephen, who's one of my professors. Uh, he speaks highly of you all, and I'm sure he's eager to be back with you. Uh, Haley and I really enjoyed our time with you all last week. And I'm excited to open the Word of God together once again this morning. Uh, before I go any further, uh, please bow your heads with me in prayer. Lord, we um, turn our attention to you this morning. And as we open your Word and, um, and in study, reflect on you and on the truth of your Word, would you form us into the likeness of your Son? We ask, Lord, that you would teach us what it looks like to be uh, not just hearers of the word, but doers. People who let the word of God shape and form us. So this morning, as we look at the word together, would you be glorified in our midst? And would you um, deposit things in our hearts for us to carry into our week? In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Let's jump in. Uh, last week, we started a two-part series on the book of Philemon. Uh, if you have a Bible, please start turning there now. It's just after Titus and just before Hebrews. Uh, you should have plenty of time to get there before we read it together. Uh, last week, we covered some context of the letter. We talked about how it is a personal letter written by, pa written by Paul from prison. Uh, he wrote to Philemon, a wealthy leader in the Colossian church, uh, and uh, who hosted their gatherings in his home. The nature of the letter implies that his message was for Philemon, but it was likely meant to be read before the whole gathering. Paul writes on behalf of Onesimus, a runaway slave who has come to Christ through a relationship with the apostle and who is now returning to his master. We talked about slavery last week as well. It really is the elephant in the room when we talk about the letter to Philemon. We covered how Roman law saw slaves as persons by nature, but economically they were treated as property. Uh, they were the one-size-fits-all workforce driving the Roman uh, Empire's economy. We discussed the culture in which this slavery took place, where owning slaves was one of the only ways to achieve status or financial security. We talked about how the idea of real freedom from slavery at least in the terms we use today, was utterly foreign to Philemon's cultural context. Many household slaves were given the opportunity to earn their freedom, but the nature of, of their culture dictated that even freedom often did little to change their circumstances. Is any of this jogging your memory? Good. We also worked through the first seven verses of the letter where Paul calls himself a prisoner of Christ, uh, he greets Philemon and tells of his gratitude for Philemon's faithful ministry in the church. He prays that uh, Philemon would experience the mutual participation in faith, which comes with, with, with Christian relationships, so that he might know the fullness of unity in those relationships, which comes through Christ. Finally, he calls Philemon brother on account of their shared ministry and faith. This uh, leads us to the big moment in the letter and the focus of our time today. Paul is writing with a specific request. Uh, let's turn to the word. This morning I want to read the whole letter with you. Uh, it's not long at all, not even long enough to have chapters, but when people ask you what you've done today, you can tell them you read a whole book of, book of the Bible this morning. It'll be very impressive. Are you ready? Let's jump in. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and, T and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to this church that meets in your home, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank God when I mention you in my prayers. 
because I hear of your love for all the saints and, with, and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Let's pause there. That's verse 7. We're now entering new, into new territory. So listen closely. For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on, on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful to both you and me. I am sending him back to you. I am sending my very own heart I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but out of your own free will. For perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a, br a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, and how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, since I hope that through your prayers I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, and so do Mark, Arist uh, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There we are, a whole book of the Bible in one go. Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, good job. Uh, I still remember the first time I read Philemon. I was struck by the simple beauty of the letter, but I also remember getting to the end with two big questions uh, you might relate to. First, why doesn't Paul explicitly uh, command Philemon to free Onesimus? Why doesn't he explicitly condemn slavery? Uh, like I promised last, last week, I plan to handle these questions in more detail today. The second question, why does Paul phrase his request in this specific way? Uh, let me explain what I mean with a story. I am the second of five kids, and I grew up with tons of friends running around in our, in our home. I clearly remember the weird ways in which kids try to manipulate emotions and circumstances to get their way. Uh, one year on Easter, after a fruitful early morning hunt for candy-filled eggs and Hershey's Kisses hidden by the Easter bunny, uh, my siblings and I set aside our woven baskets full of fake grass and small wrapped treats and got ready for church. At that age, I was attentive to the service, uh, but let's be honest, my thoughts were drifting frequently to the seemingly enormous chocolate bunny that waited for me when I got back home. Uh, I'd already asked when we could have some candy. My mom had said after lunch, and now the clock was ticking. I needed to get home. As we sat in the church service with my best friend's family uh, and partway through the service, likely detecting my impatience, uh, my friend leaned over and gave me some Starbursts, a gift. Uh, albeit not too generous. They were orange Starbursts, which is objectively the worst flavor. Uh, but they were a gift, and I was truly grateful. A little bit of sugar to, to hold me over. Uh, his family came over for the meal, and later that day, after we ate, we all got to have some Easter candy. As I went to break off a little piece of that precious chocolate bunny, I heard him say, uh, Remember when I gave you those Starbursts earlier? <laughs> That's right checkmate. Uh, you know this is where this is going. My mind raced back, realizing Starburst came only after I'd told him about my chocolate bunny. Uh, he had me, and the only way to not look like a jerk was to share uh, orange Starbursts with ulterior motives. 
That's what I mean when I say Paul's request felt uncomfortable when I first read Philemon. It felt like the apostle was warming his friend up with some generous praise, like starbursts slipped along the aisle, only to drop a costly request in his lap. If we don't take some time to examine what Paul writes more closely, his request can feel disingenuous at best and manipulative at worst. It is important that we spend the rest of our time together this morning clearing those hurdles so that the apostle's remarkable message might speak to our own lives with resounding clarity. Uh, We'll allow the text to be our roadmap as we go forward. Our three movements will be uh, Paul's, uh, the request, uh, the relationship, the request, the relationships, and the implications for for you and for me, excuse me. Uh, First, the request. Paul says that he is filled with joy and encouragement because of the love and ministry of Philemon in the Colossian church. Far from an orange starburst bait and switch, uh, he says that it is exactly because of who he already knows Philemon to be that Paul can send him this letter. He's not twisting the church leader's arm. Verse 8 says that he is already confident that all he would need to do is ask, and Philemon would welcome Onesimus back with grace simply because it is the right thing to do. However, Paul wants to do more than just check a morality box. He wants to stress test the work of the gospel in Philemon's life and community. Do you remember verse 6 from last week? Uh, Paul's after what he's been praying for all along, the thing he told Philemon he'd been praying for, that the grace which marks Christian life and relationships would have its full effect in in this leader. Said more simply, uh, Paul is taking two people who have both experienced the gospel of grace which has restored their relationship with God, but who have a rift in their own relationship. And he's putting them next to each other, back in proximity and in shared life. He's expecting that their mutual experience of the forgiveness and reconciliation of Jesus will do more than repair their relationship. He says that He is making his appeal on the basis of love. He wants to build on the strengths he has identified in the earlier verses. Paul announces Onesimus' salvation to Philemon. It's it's a celebratory proclamation. And he asks him to welcome his former slave back as more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. Once again, this is not a bait and switch. We know this because the letter showed up with Onesimus. He didn't jump out from behind a pillar after he read the letter to the point where Paul made his request. He showed up with the letter. He came back to submit himself to the process Paul was inviting them to work out in their community. Paul's thinking here should feel very similar to, uh, very familiar to us. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells a parable about a servant who owed his master money. Does this sound familiar already? For reference, one of the 10,000 gold talents owed in the story would equate to a generous year's salary for someone in the middle class. Some scholars point out that this makes the owed sum comparable in modern terms to 400 billion U.S. dollars. That's a four with 11 zeros after it. It's an impossible sum. In the parable, the king forgives this impossible debt only for his servant to go and demand the modern equivalent of a few dollars from a fellow servant. When he can't pay, the first servant has him thrown in prison. His graceless treatment of his neighbor infuriates his master, who throws him in prison until such a time as he can pay all that he originally owed. Jesus says, So also my, so also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives his brother or sister from your heart. Uh, Sorry, there it is. Uh, Seems a little intense, right? The late, great uh, Tim Keller writes on this very passage, saying, Jesus' final sentence means that divine mercy should change our hearts so that we are able to forgive as God forgave us. If we will not offer others forgiveness, it shows that we did not truly repent and receive God's. Jesus is making an observation, not a threat. It can be summed up in this way. Forgiven people forgive people. If you are in Christ, 
the staggering debt brought on by you brought on by your sin has been absorbed by God in a radical act of forgiveness our experience of that grace is reshaping our hearts to be the people the kind of people who offer our smaller weaker forgiveness freely drawing from our 400 billion dollar reserves of grace it's a lot harder than it sounds though right uh, in his letter to Philemon, Paul seems to be demonstrating Jesus' teaching in the real world. He's inviting Philemon to forgive a much smaller debt, recognizing Onesimus as a brother in need of just as much grace. All right, you may be thinking to yourself, but what does this request mean when it comes to slavery? How can forgiveness be rooted in recognition of a shared need for grace? when slavery's dehumanization keeps people from seeing each other as equals. It is true that Paul's, Paul seemingly neglects to command Onesimus' freedom. However, his letter takes a form which would have been recognizable to ancient readers. It resembles a letter of recommendation. These were used at the time for upper-class individuals uh, writing to peers or subordinates. They would write an appeal to establish, to establish a relationship in order to ask for personal favors. Uh, Paul understands his, audi his audience, and he's write his writing highlights their shared brotherhood, but also his status as Philemon's spiritual father, just, just like he is with, for Onesimus. He uses a style of appeal that Philemon would find convincing. All the starbursts we, were, we are wary of when we read Paul's argument are stylistic choices which made sense for this type of letter. As mentioned above, his request is forgiveness and reconciliation, but I think it goes well beyond that. Paul's request is simply not as clear as you or I might write it because this is not a letter writing style or argument we would use today. He is deeply concerned with Onesimus' reception as he returns to Colossae, and with his status as a slave. But he writes with tact as he addresses the issue. To fully grasp the layers of how Paul is, uh, is, is calling for reconciliation and how he's addressing slavery, we must turn to our second movement, uh, the relationships in the letter. First, in verse 10, Paul includes Onesimus in the familial language he uses in the letter. He calls him son, which was common practice for rabbis and their disciples. However, Paul loads the term with weight. To call Onesimus a spiritual son was to put him on a level plane with Philemon, who verse 19 tells us owed his own salvation to Paul's ministry. In verses 11 through 14, Paul mentions Onesimus' usefulness to his spiritual family, which is wordplay, by the way, because Onesimus' name actually means useful. So he's saying, he became useless to you. He be you lost him. But in being returned to and reconciled to you, he's being made useful to you and to me. He's being made useful to the church again. He's being made himself. Uh, <clears throat> Paul does not want to send him back to Colossae on account of that usefulness. But he does so, seemingly as an act of due diligence. Verse 14 implies that his return is not... Uh, his return to Paul is not out of the question. But culturally, this would have involved a release from household duty for another service, effectively freeing him to serve God. So here, already, Paul is hinting at a, at a release from this, this responsibility of a slave. Paul resumes his familial language in verses 15 through 16, where he writes in a pondering tone, for perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly beloved brother, or dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Rather than explicit command, Paul offers a compelling image of Onesimus as part of the family. To call Onesimus Philemon's brother was to invoke uh, a welcome and treatment which slaves did not deserve in, within this culture. Uh, a brother would not be viewed as property and would obviously be treated as family. Uh, Paul's inclusion of himself in that brotherhood even further elevates Onesimus. He's saying, I, the, 
I, my own participation is the same as his in this family. Uh, and this immediately weakens the dehumanizing force of Onesimus' slave status. It waters the seed planted by Paul's family language and damages the idea of human ownership. In verse 17, Paul identifies himself with Philemon as a spiritual equal and commands him to welcome his former slave as he would the apostle himself. Now, it's easy to breeze past this specific verse, but it's actually very critical. Remarkably, this goes even further than the familial language we've been talking about, as it invokes the cultural rules of hospitality, which required a host to serve the needs of their honored guest, even above those of their family. Do you see how Paul's slowly stepping on the gas here? He's building an argument, not just about grace, not just about forgiveness, but also uh, elevating Onesimus' status as he, as he steps on the gas. He equates himself with both Philemon and Onesimus in the most intimate terms that he can, calling them to the mutual participation in the faith. From verse 6, he is after a unity and equality that affects their real lived relationship and the power dynamics of the culture and age in which they live. This is seen again in verses 18 and 19. Paul accepts any debts Philemon might still require of his slaves, saying that he will pay them. As an aside, he reminds his friend of the debt he is himself owed, but does not require. See, culturally, friends were bound by this expectation of reciprocal favors. If I did something good for you, I could cash in on it later in equal value. Ironically, it's a bit like the candy story earlier. Uh, it, as Philemon's spiritual father, Paul could claim to be owed Philemon's new life. It is an impossible debt, one which Paul reminds him he is not cashing in on. So why does he bring it up? He is once again acting out the, par the parable in Matthew 18. Philemon's debt has been absorbed by Paul, which is another way of describing forgiveness. Even more significantly, the apostle who is himself owed uh, is offering his own resources to mend the broken relationship between these two men. He is acting out the gospel. That is what Christ did for us. When we, when he, when we owed more than we could pay, he absorbed our debt on our behalf, setting us free and enabling us to forgive the debt of others. If we understand the letter as primarily addressing forgiveness and reconciliation, but also speaking to the issue of slavery, the apostle's confidence in verses 20 through 21 become even more striking. He writes, <clears throat> Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Paul is going through the proper rhetorical method for his request writing in a style which makes sense to Philemon. But under it all, he is confident that his brother will actually exceed the requirements of simple obedience. Does this mean that he made peace with Onesimus? It would seem so. As a, a letter which uh, called so directly for forgiveness and failed to achieve it would probably not have made its way into the biblical canon it would have immediately lacked the authority necessary to be seen as, a, as, as scripture. Now, did Philemon's exceeding of the commands also mean that he freed Onesimus and treated him as family? Um, we can hope so. I think the same argument applies. The letter shows rhetorically how the gospel lifts Onesimus to a new status. But if it did not also do so practically, it is doubtful it would have been passed on. We have no way of knowing if it's the same man, but interestingly, some scholars and traditions believe that a certain bishop of Ephesus named Onesimus, a free man who is recorded in history, was the same one freed by Philemon. And maybe even that he was the one who gathered Paul's letters together for the canon. I don't know about you, but I'm eager to hear the story in heaven one day. Regarding slavery, it can be easy to fault Paul or other biblical writers for not calling for abolition more clearly. However, as we discussed before, there was no cultural category for such a call. 
when, when read shallowly, texts like Philemon have unfortunately been used uh, as justification for slavery. When read deeply, they have informed and encouraged human dignity and freedom, even providing biblical justification for abolition efforts. Personally, I think the letter also likely resulted in the freedom of one man in particular, Onesimus, and that is a victory won by the gospel. However, we must acknowledge that while slavery is the issue which can seem most glaring from our historical vantage uh, of the letter, Paul is concerned about m- much more. He seeks to repair a relationship by inviting Philemon and Onesimus to work out their salvation. That brings us to the third movement of our time together, the implications for you and me. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 says that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. It is both beautiful, it is beautiful that this personal letter was not only preserved, but also included in the Bible, but we have, we, as we've discussed these last two weeks, but we uh, sorry, I lost my place. Uh, it is a small but mighty book which invites us as readers to grapple with how the gospel engages our individual relationships and the values of our broader culture. For Philemon, this letter meant something very specific and grounded. The, the letter accomplished something in his life. And likewise, it's meant to accomplish something in ours. He shows us that our experience of vertical grace, that is from God to us, should give us resources for offering grace horizontally to one another. We exist in a largely graceless culture, increasingly losing our vocabulary around forgiveness and mercy. And and one of the issues that's at stake in letters like this as we read them in a modern context is whether we can understand that the the grace we experience from Jesus, the grace that the gospel bestows on us, actually teaches us, gives us reserves from which to draw as we extend forgiveness to one another. Last week we talked about what Philemon's experience of reading this letter must have been like. It's comfortable when the message is highlighting the places we've got figured out. But what about when it points out places that, we, that the gospel have yet to touch? How do we respond when we are given opportunities to forgive or realize that we need to repent and ask for forgiveness ourselves? Are we as quick to listen? In James 1.22, which I've already quoted today, but believers are encouraged to be doers of the word and not hearers only. So what questions can we ask ourselves as we reflect on Philemon. For our purposes this morning, I want to look at Philemon and Onesimus to see how their respective roles in the story of the letter might teach us. For some of us, hearing the request Paul makes to Philemon is hitting all too close to home. Maybe a member of your household has wronged you. Maybe a church you used to attend hurt you deeply. Maybe you need to forgive a member of this community or a friend. For some who feel the invitation from God to forgive this morning, it feels like the natural next step. You feel ready for Scripture's invitation and are already making plans to take tangible steps towards reconciliation. Praise God, that seems to be the response Paul is hoping for from Philemon himself. For others, you're still stuck on Jesus' statement in Matthew 18, where he says, so also my heavenly Father will do to you unless every one of you forgives your brother or sister from your heart. That sounds hard. You carry deep wounds in your heart, which you are not sure the gospel can reach the depths of. First, that's a beautiful and important self-awareness to have. And I'm praying that your experience of the gospel in the coming season is so profound that it reaches places you thought would remain dead forever. that's what Jesus does. He comes for all of you, even the messy, hurt places. It may be helpful to more thoroughly define forgiveness. Uh, One way to understand forgiveness is the way in which I have mostly used the term today. 
It is the absor- uh, absorbing of debt into oneself. This is what we see in the, the parable of the unforgiving servant. It's, this is what we experience in the gospel. We owe God our deaths because of sin, but he takes that debt into himself for us, offering us life instead. This is the forgiveness which wipes the slate clean and welcomes reconciliation. It is the kind of forgiveness Paul is calling Philemon to demonstrate. A second definition is also helpful, especially in instances where restoration of relationship might be damaging. Here, forgiveness is understood as the giving up of our perceived right to accomplish justice for ourselves. We allow the Lord to be God, the, the God of vengeance we see in the Old Testament. Friends, I promise you, one day every injustice you have ever suffered will be righted. Sometimes forgiveness is just whispering to God. I'll let you deal with them rather than dwelling on the hurt they've caused. I think it was Carrie Fisher, oddly enough, who said, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. Forgiveness saves us from that poison and from being slaves to hate. In this second definition. Reconciliation is a best case scenario to be hoped for after forgiveness, but it is not always in the cards. A great example is uh, Corey Ten Boom, who met and forgave guards from the concentration camp she was held in during World War II, the same prison in which her sister tragically died. Corey looked them in the eyes, and she told them she forgave them. Obviously, forgiveness did not mean that she had to invite them over for dinner and welcome them into her inner circle of friends. No, she just released justice into the Lord's hands and was able to see the same brokenness, pain, and rage in herself that she saw in them. Like Philemon, she forgave them because she had tasted a grace rich enough to share, even with her enemies. For others this morning, The situation that comes to mind is more like that of Onesimus. You have wronged another in big ways or small, and the Holy Spirit has been convicting your heart last week and this morning. One of the most understated and beautiful parts of the letter to Philemon is the willingness of Onesimus to return to Colossae. Put put yourself in his shoes for a moment. We talked last week about uh, the intensity that existed around leaving your master as a slave in, in, under Roman law. It was, it was so extreme that uh, under Roman law, Philemon could ex- ex- extract any kind of punishment he wanted against uh, an Onesimus upon his return. Now, there's a level where, obviously, Paul's writing with this confidence that Philemon is a man of God who loves the church, cares for people really well, whose life is marked by love. So at some level, Onesimus can return with confidence that Philemon's not the kind of vindictive person who's going to just punish him that harshly. But still, culturally, to return was to open himself up to the danger of being punished. Uh, Rather than running away, though, he seeks to walk out the full scope of grace even when it requires him to repent. Um, Paul sends him back and, and allows him, gives him this beautiful opportunity to return to one, to, to another brother who he himself has harmed and to, to apologize, to present himself for reconciliation. He returns to Philemon, a man who has every legal right, like I said, to punish him severely, but he returns with a clear intention to work out this issue between them which he himself caused. He willingly participates in Paul's experiment. Really, it's Jesus' experiment his actions ask the question, how strong, just how strong is the grace of God? I believe that Onesimus' hopes may have been even exceeded. Uh, If this morning you're hearing the invitation to seek reconciliation as the offending party, that is a beautiful work of God which I encourage you to pursue in the weeks ahead. There are a few things that test our conviction of, of the gospel that we have experienced quite as much as uh, being asked to initiate reconciliation when we, have actu- we are the ones who've done the harm. In C.S. Lewis's uh, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which is a part of the, um, the Chronicles of Narnia series, we are introduced to Eustace. He's 
cousin to the Pevensies, the main children in the, st- the stories. And he's depicted as this selfish, prideful, greedy, mean child. Even upon getting thrust into this magical world by falling through a painting and being scooped out of the sea and onto a ship full of talking animals adventuring their way across the ocean, he still is bitter and mean-spirited. The first things out of his mouth are, are cruel and uh, like diminishing of others. He, as the story progresses, actually like becomes the physical embodiment of those things. When he falls asleep on top of a dragon's hoard with a gold armband around his arm and wakes up as a dragon. He becomes this like image of greed and evil that, that C.S. Lewis then pits against God in the story. He pits it against Aslan. There's this moment where Edward Eustace comes to the end of himself, desperate to, to find a way back into intimacy and close relationship that he didn't even realize he had lost until he could no longer speak. And he comes across this lion. He he retells the story after stumbling back into their camp as a human again. He runs, the first person he runs into at the edge of the campfire light is Edmund, which if you know anything from the first book, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Edmund is the sibling who sells out his siblings for a few treats, who becomes a traitor to everything good, And the only way for him to be restored is Aslan gives his own life. Just as Jesus did for us, it's it's an allegory. He gives his own life in order to save Edmund. And that's the person who uh, Eustace runs into at the edge of the fire. Uh, He he retells this story of having the scales stripped away by Aslan, this lion. But he doesn't know who it is at the time. He's just telling the story of being freed of being restored, of being dressed, clothed, and sent back to the camp. And he just kind of baffled, says, what, what do you think it was then? Uh, and Edmund responds, I think you've seen Aslan. Eustace shows up to apologize, but he comes with this experience of grace, of being restored and cared for and clothed and like, met in his need and in his desperation. And he comes stumbling back into the camp to the exact person who can relate with him. He, he apologizes. And I, it's one of the most understated conversations in the whole book. Edmund almost just kind of sweeps the apology aside. Just like, yeah, I know, I get it. That's the, that's the summary of the conversation. He's just going, I know, I've been there. How could he not forgive Eustace? when he himself had been a traitor. That's what he actually says about himself. He says, between ourselves, when everyone else is starting to walk over, he says, between ourselves, you haven't been half as bad as I was on my first trip to Narnia. I was a traitor. He's just going to say, you've been a jerk. I was a traitor. There's a recognition of shared experience of grace that Edmund has. He sees it in Eustace's eyes as he comes stumbling out into the, the firelight. He this, this recognition, this shared experience that sweeps away all of the, the abuse, all of the, the verbal abuse that Ed Eustace had heaped on Edmund. Throughout the book, he's constantly being mean and belittling and cruel to, to Edmund. He's constantly going after him. And Edmund, in this one moment, sees that Eustace has met Aslan, and he goes, that's okay. You get it. You know exactly. You see why I'm not heaping it back on you. There's this shared recognition that actually is very reminiscent, I think, of what Paul is hoping for as he sends Onesimus back to Philemon. He's hoping that all of the tension, all of the harm, all of the things that have built up between them in Onesimus' absence, the debt that's owed, as he enters back into that community, that Philemon will be able to see him and say, welcome, brother. You've, I know exactly who you've been with because I have been with him too. I know exactly who's cared for you because I have been cared for by the same grace. They share in that same story. Do we carry grace that closely to our hearts? When we encounter others who share our faith, even those who have wronged us, 
is our knee-jerk response, is our first response, like Eustace is in the story. Is it like what we assume Philemon's likely was when Onesimus showed up on his doorstep with a letter from Paul? Is it one of recognition that the work that God is doing in that person is the same work that he's been doing in us all along? Like I said before, we exist in a moment where, a cultural moment, where we no longer seem to know how to talk about forgiveness. And it is our job as, a, as the church, as the people who carry the story of the gospel in our communities. We, we bear the presence of God in our midst. We are the temple to be the place that when people look at us, they see the proof of God. They see love. They see grace being extended in our midst because we have tasted a wealth, a, a deep, sweet, rich well of grace, which now we extend to one another and to those in our communities. I want to take a second, just like we did last week, to um, turn it to reflective prayer, to take a second to let the Holy Spirit speak to us, to let um, him draw to our minds and to our attentions moments from the past uh, few weeks, maybe days, maybe even hours, opportunities that we have to either, like Philemon, um, extend grace, or like Onesimus, come in repentant uh, pursuit of reconciliation, to request for the, the kind of parlay that happens uh, when believers come together, when, when we approach others from a place of knowing our deep need for grace. So, if you'll bow your heads with me, I'll lead us in a short prayer. Jesus, we thank you for the beauty of the gospel. We thank you that um, the story we hold, the story we believe is true, says that um, we have been forgiven a debt which we never could have paid. That $400 billion debt has been wiped off the table Jesus, you tell us that people who have experienced grace, forgiven people, forgive people. That we recognize in one another the shared humanity, the shared need for grace that levels us all at the feet of the cross. So this morning, would you help us as we even now just turn our minds back across um, this morning, across um, the previous week, as we cast our minds back, even down years of our lives, if there are places where you want us to work out the gospel between us and other people, would you draw it to our minds now? For some, it may be um, the need to forgive for others. It's the need to repent and seek reconciliation. Would you give us the strength to know how to do that well? And would you give us the um, boldness to even as we go from this place seek after the kind of reconciliation that Paul envisions as he writes this letter. Teach us how to be people of grace. Here we pray. Amen. Uh, yeah, that's, that's it this morning. That's the, that's the whole message. We have to be people who taste of God's grace. And if that feels like a foreign idea to you, if, that, if it seems like, I don't know if my experience of grace is, is weighty enough to drive me to the things that I feel like are even coming to my mind as we pray, I would encourage you, like, fill your mind with Christ. Turn to the, turn to the Gospels. And read them, cover like ed, front to back, over and over and over again, as you witness the grace and mercy and kindness of Jesus in the Gospels. I guarantee you, it will shape the way that you see yourself. It will inform your identity, and it will shape the way that you address relationships and and dis, even disagreements and heart, hurt and harm with others. That's all Paul's after in his letter. He's after grace. And so should we.
Thank you. Thank you, Drew. Let's, uh, let's rise and sing a song in response.
would you send us? Would you make your face shine upon us? And Jesus, would we be the kind of people who um, represent you well in the world? We love you. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated after a moment of silence.